Shalom Aleichem. My name is Miriam Isaacs. I'm talking about the Stonehill Archive. It consists of over a thousand songs. Many of them uh, are songs about loss, about homelessness, about dealing with the Holocaust. This was all collected in 1948 by survivors who are doing the singing. Men, women, and children, many of them very young. So this is a rare treasure, and I hope you value it and uh, pursue uh, further development of this material. Join me in welcoming Miriam Isaacs to this wonderful venue. Thank you all for coming out, and it's wonderful. I so many familiar faces and people I know but most exciting to me, actually, is Ben Stonehill's granddaughter is here. She just introduced herself to me. She is back here. And uh, this keeps, you know, this keeps happening. And we had a, a launch for a website for this collection in May in New York City, and both of his sons came. Uh, that's them over here, and that's the collector, Ben Stonehill. And, um, I want to talk, I'll start out by talking about him and what he did and, and speculate as to why he did what he did. Um, so in uh, 1948, was, it was a very important time for Yiddish culture, for survivors of the Holocaust. Uh, three years after the war ended, and many, and I know this from my own family and from many people that things hadn't settled in any sort of way. Most survivors could not go back to their homes. Uh, if they went back to their homes, they found nobody, nothing. Uh, and so, uh, and there was no country to go to. I was born in Germany and we were stateless on my birth certificate. In Ginsburg, Germany, it says Jew and uh, stateless. You know, so we, um, we were in these DP camps in Germany, Austria, Italy, and uh, the United States had a quota system. My father was a Polish Jew, so it was a long quota list, and we couldn't get in, and we finally wound up in Canada. But there was this kind of transitional state, and I became interested in Yiddish culture in this time because I realized that this was the last time, really, that Yiddish was a necessary language. In these DP camps, there was a, a Yiddish culture taking place. Not everybody spoke Yiddish, and there were things happening in other languages. Actually, in the DP camp where I was born, there were also a lot of Hungarian speakers. Um, but Yiddish was the language in which a Jew from Hungary could speak to a Jew from Russia, could speak to a Jew from America. And so it became the lingua franca in this, for Jews in this post-war era. And um, Jews being Jews, they started publishing immediately. <laughs> you know, they, st <laughs> they, did. they started um, trying their best to revive and maintain their culture. So there were lectures, there were concerts, there were all kinds of cultural activities because they realized that not only did their bodies have to be restored, but even more importantly, their spirits had to be restored. And it's only through um, dealing uh, through, through creativity, through the arts, through reclaiming your cultural heritage that you could do that. So when I became aware of this body of song that had been archived, um, and I'll talk about the archiving process a little bit later, but it, it was collected in 48 in a hotel in, uh, on Broadway and 103rd Street. I've been to this hotel now several times and now houses immigrants still. It's mostly elderly people. It's one of these apart hotels. And um, uh, Ben Stonehill, who ha was the youngest of 10 children and born in Poland, but had come to the United States as a young child, uh, but was a lover of Yiddish and a lover of Jewish culture, he undertook uh, pretty much on his own to uh, get hold of some recording equipment, wire reels, and he traveled from Sunnyside, Queens, to Manhattan, schlepping this, this, this stuff, uh, and from morning till night recorded survivors. Most of the survivors that he recorded were young. Um, most of the old people had been killed. So you have people who are 18, 19. The youngest that I've heard him interview is a nine-year-old girl. 
Um, there are some 12-year-olds, 14-year-olds. Um, so the, these are young people, a lot of them, um, who have either been in the partisans or in camps or in labor camps or you know, just flung far and wide. And they, they um, made it as far as New York. And it's the summer of 1948 for the most part. The state of Israel had only just been established. And Stonehill, and, and I think in a way it's very fortunate, he was not a trained ethnographer. He, uh, he would ask them their names and sometimes they would tell him. He would ask them where they were from and sometimes they would tell him. Uh, but mostly these were people who were hanging around a hotel lobby and really forming a kind of temporary community with each other as they were looking for places to live, relatives to take them in, jobs, careers, a future. They were not yet, these were, this was temporary housing. This was not permanent state for them. Some of them were only days off their ships, um, uh, wherever they came from. And so he, he recorded them on wire reels, and I, I brought some samples of the songs. But there are oh, 1,057 songs, and I would say 95% of them are in Yiddish. There are a few in Polish and Russian and German. And the songs themselves tell a story. Um, when people do Holocaust studies, they're very fond of facts. You know, how many were killed here and what was there. What they rarely talk about is the, the world of emotion. And what these songs say uh, to me in many ways is uh, people who are uh, destitute or who are seeing a lot about loss of home and homelessness and what it's like to be a refugee at, at your soul and your, in your heart, but also about young people who want to start over and there's a bunch of love songs and uh, some even really smutty songs that made me blush when I heard them. So they, they just sang what they felt like. And sometimes they would, s you, you could hear from the audio, um, they would uh, help each other out if they couldn't remember the words, or they would laugh, or they would better each other. There were a bunch of young guys and the, the d doing the dirty songs. So, oh, you know this one? I know. How about this one? And then, you know, I know one about this. Most of the dirty songs were about rabbis, actually, for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> or no, more over the rabbis' wives, the rebetzin, that was a major theme. So, so Stonehill came with this recording equipment, and he would go back and forth and recorded about 39 hours of sound. And he had hoped that this material would wind up in a university or he would write a book. He actually had planned initially a book, but he was a working person with a family responsibility, so he couldn't do the book. And in 48 and 49, no, nobody wanted it. The universities turned him down. So he kept it in his home in Sunnyside, Queen. And then in 1964, he came down with cancer. And he knew he was going to die. And he made another effort to uh, find a home for this material. And luckily, uh, by that time, there was a woman named Ray Corson at the Library of Congress. And she had begun to catalog this sort of music. And she took the collection. And he insisted that he oversee the transfer from wire reel to tape and that it be done slowly and that it be done carefully. So he, he, he did that. And he gave a lecture at Evo, which is part of the archive. And then he passed away in, in 64 or 65, somewhere in there. Um, and it's been sitting in a, a variety of places. Uh, the Holocaust Museum, I think, acquired it in around 1998, if I'm not mistaken. And Brett Werb, who's the uh, musicologist there, uh, recommended it to me. And um, I decided that being a native speaker of Yiddish uh, and growing up hearing different dialects of Yiddish, and because I'm a linguist, this was an important project to undertake. And so I, I was a fellow at the museum and worked with Brett to begin to develop this material. And then the question is, what do you do with it? There's songs of every kind. Um, and I'm an old folky from way back. So I had a copy of Rise Up singing on my table. And uh, that inspired me to sort the songs thematically by love song, by songs about labor in the camp, by lullabies. Um, so I began to do that. And then 
uh, about two years ago, um, I, I, through the Smithsonian, I became involved with people who are working with endangered languages. And um, the Center for Traditional Music and Dance, Ethel Rame, I don't know if any of you know who she is, but she's an important figure in, in uh, ethnic music, and she recorded with the Penny Whistlers way back when. Anyway, so I'm, I've been working with the Center for Traditional Music and Dance to create a website for this, these songs. And so far we have about, well, 67 songs posted and many more on the way. So here is a picture of um, Ben Stonehill and his two sons who are no longer kids anymore and um, back, I guess, in 48. And here is his voice. And he's, I love this one because he's explaining to a kid what a microphone is. So reden sei ich und auch singen. Es kommt da rechts von meinem Moyo. Geht da rein im Mikrofon. Geht da rein auf den Draht. Magnetisch auf den Draht. Jetzt da rass ich wieder was zurückspielen. Bis der Herr mein Stimme rauskommt von dem Räder. Jetzt da. Lass mal sagen, was ist dein Name? Okay, so he's asking what's your name and he's explaining that whatever I say goes magnetically onto this wire and then you can hear it again. So <coughs> here I have an illustration. A, a part of my research was in looking at the uh, newspapers and publications from the DP camps in the post-war era. This particular drawing was from the Bergen-Belsen DP camp. Very often the concentration camps just turned into housing uh, post-war and uh, they put out publications, uh, quite a few, and those are housed at Evo and at the Holocaust Museum and other places. And they're really a treasure trove of knowledge about the, those post-war years. And here you see an image of the partisans and the song, Never say that you're going to go the last route. I have here a list of... Um, ben, ben Stonehill was not alone in what he was doing. Um, there, there was a, a, a collector, performer, lecturer, Ruth Rubin, who was very important in collecting songs right after the war from survivors. A man named David Boder, who interviewed survivors in Germany and has some songs. There's somebody named in Australia named Joseph Toltz who's researching that collection. Hannah and Joseph Mlotik have done a huge amount of work with the Workman Circle. And then Schmerke Kaczerginski. Schmerke Kaczerginski is a very important figure for you to know about if you don't already. He was uh, a poet and a writer uh, uh, before the war in Vilna, in Lithuania, Vilnius now. And he, uh, <coughs> he escaped from the Vilna ghetto and became a partisan. And while he was being a partisan, he was collecting songs and also writing very important songs. Um, in 48, he came from Paris to New York to record, well, to be part of a conference that was taking place that summer in New York about rescuing Yiddish culture because those who loved Yiddish knew that Yiddish culture was endangered already then. The ma vast majority of Yiddish speakers had been exterminated in a very short amount of time. So there was a congress that he came to from Paris, and he came to the Hotel Marseille and recorded quite a number of songs for Ben Stonehill. And that's really precious, especially because Kaczerginski perished in an airplane crash only a few years after that, in 54. Having survived a whole war, he was um, going home to his daughter's birthday. And the, in, Aust in Argentina, the plane crashed and he perished. So he, he's in this archive. And Diana Blumenfeld, who had been a performer in the Warsaw Ghetto, she was an important actress, a singer, well-known and loved, and married to uh, Jonas Turkov, who was a star of Yiddish stage. Um, so she survived the war and performed in the DP camps and then is recorded in the Stonehill archive. And, um, went on, lived, she, she lived until 1961, and she has this beautiful voice. So those are just some of the important people in this collection. So here is a picture of Kaczyginski, and here is, the, there's two songs here. One is a, is an, is a, 
a, a ballad about a hero named Botvin. And I had never heard of Botvin, but anybody who grew up in communist Poland would have heard, a Jew growing up in com communist Poland would, would know about him. In Sweden, I gave this talk, and somebody in the audience got up and was so excited. We all learned that song about Botvin. He was important. Why was he important? He was a communist, a, a labor organizer in Poland in the 1920s. And there was a, um, an inf infiltrator that came, came around, and Botvin took a gun and shot him right in the heart and killed him, for which he was immediately arrested and executed. Um, but he became a, a, a social uh, figure, a hero, and a brigade in the uh, Spanish um, Civil War you know, against Franco uh, was named for Botvin. So there's a ballad about Botvin, and then there's another song that I have here called Pack Up. Um, and uh, Kaczyginski wrote this, he was with the Jews in the Vilna Ghetto, and there was a declaration that had come out from the Germans, uh, a, not an order, that they should all evacuate to Riga. And the song is, a, it's the refrain is pack up, pack up. And he says, we Jews were always being told to pack up. You know, today they're sending us, to, today we're locals, tomorrow they're sending us to Riga. But at that time, the Soviet army was getting close, and they were hoping that the Soviet army would come soon and get rid of the Germans. So he was, the last verse is a kind of assertion that the, soon the Germans would have to pack up and go. And we'll say that to them, you pack up. So a bunch of the songs are very much about asserting uh, some measure of control over things or some hope or some aspiration. And a, lot, a bunch of the songs actually are about revenge. You know, we don't hear that much in Holocaust literature, but I'm not surprised to hear that in a lot of, in this year and in this time about, and one of the refrains that comes up again and again is we're gonna drive them from Berlin to Budapest. I don't know why that scans well, but. So here is a little bit of Botvin. I'm not going to sing the whole thing because there's many verses. Botvin is Botvin. Botvin is was 18. Took part in the com. So the singer here is a man named Avrumche. That's all I know about him. But he sings quite a few of the communist songs. So um, he's... he's his, pol his politics certainly showed. Here is Paxi Hein, and this is Kaczyginski himself singing this. And he learned it from Senda Weizmann. He's explaining that the Gestapo had just issued the order. In 43, the Soviets were getting close, and they had hope that they would be free soon. The end will be better. We're going to sing that song to them. Okay. So that's Kaczyginski. This is another drawing from that Bergen-Belsen newspaper. I, uh, this artist, Naponsek, is just very evocative. And you see here survivors still in their um, striped prison outfits um, uh, holding each other up. Um, and so it speaks to the, the kind of, the importance for survivors to be with each other. There was a kind of community wherever I lived uh, the, the Grine, you know, the Greenhorns would, would 
spend time with each other and uh, feel comfortable in each other's presence because they, they understood one another. A lot of them were really disappointed when they'd come to the United States or elsewhere and expect people to embrace them with open arms and found much, much less than that. Um, a kind of, we don't want to hear about it, you know, learn English, move on with your life, you know, let's, don't depress us with this stuff and don't ask for money for, uh, from us and stuff. That was not uncommon. So to be in a community of other survivors was important. And also, uh, the newspapers and the songs formed a kind of memorialization in a way for the lost family members and lost communities that they had. We ha you had the Yisker books, these remembrance books, and a lot of the DP publications sort of began the formative gathering of material for these various community books. So um, there's a kind of subculture of the DP camp. And here is a song, um, it's called Dort in dem Lager, and a survivor is describing what it's like in that camp. And he's standing there, and he's, he's, he's in forced labor, slave labor, and he's talking about how it feels, you know, and he's saying, what's the point? Every, every energy is wasted with this, uh, and here I am. And then the next refrain, he sees a girl with a shovel in her hand, um, and also for her, you know, is, is this energy being wasted? Um, and it's, it's in some corner at night that they're standing. Whoops. Did I mess up? Yes, I did. Whoops. Wait a second. I have to hit this thing, not that thing. Okay. Dort in Lager in a winkel by Nacht. Dort in the lager in a winkel by night. He does not know where the melody came from. Dort in the lager in a winkel by night. And clerk sich as oi a shoot ye de arbeit, a shoot ye de me. Tat in your himmel, Father in heaven, wie lang wird es noch dauern? How long will this last? Alle Mittel muss ein probieren. I've tried all means. Ich hab schon mehr kein Kopf. And I have no more strength. Yes, bleib ich allein, du. Here I'm alone. And think about my happy hour. I guess of freedom, Father. In the same country in a camp. Young woman with a shovel in her hand. And clear to us, I see. I should ye the arbeit, I should ye the me. Tat in your own himmel, wie lang wird es noch dauern? Alle Mittel muss ein probiert, ich hab sie mehr kein Kreuz. Yes, bleib ich allein, du. Now I'm alone here. Entracht wegen mein glücklicher Schuh. And a third verse in that same country is a little boy frozen in the cold. He's thinking about what's the use. Wie hat mein meine Tate in der Mama weggeht? And he wonders, where did they take his father and mother away to? Tate Mama meine, wie groß ist mein Pein? How great is my pain? Wie groß ist mein Hinge? How great my hunger? Ra, 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 ra. And he doesn't remember that. Jetzt line. bleib ich allein, du. I'm alone here. In Tracht wegen mein glücklicher Schuh, Tate nu. One of the things that I find so moving about this collection is that these are not professional singers. They're ordinary people. And it's important to understand that singing is integral to, to, to Yiddish culture. 
It wasn't something that a few people did to perform, but it was something that everybody did all the time. People, I'll, we'll do questions afterwards, but people, <clears throat> my mother, you know, had been in camps. She would sing some of these songs while she was washing the floor, while she was baking. Um, people would sing uh, lullabies to children. They would sing love songs when they were getting flirtatious. Singing is a very important part of the culture that everybody does, often with each other or uh, just to pass the time. It was before iPods. You know, so now, <laughs> now everybody has little white things in their ears and they walk around like that. But then they didn't have that yet, so, <laughs> okay. So this is uh, Diana Blumenfeld. As I mentioned, she was married to Jonas Tokov. She was born in 1903 and um, she has this wonderful voice and she was active in the underground in the Warsaw Ghetto and here is her. She's got about uh, 12 songs, I think, that she performs. Whoops, <sighs> sorry about that, let's see. I've got to wait for the little thing to come up. Okay. When I have a kaiser, so it's a smith, a gans, a lullaby. Folk to stand here, not to be a sonnige. We do this, the bomber, and I. My kind, my shy. When I say this, that I hear the ganze world is my schloss, my kind, schloss, my king. Those the long. So this is a lullaby, um, very evocative, and you know, you, you, my child, my crown are worth the whole kingdom to me. And so, a lot of the survivors had lost children. They had sometimes placed children with Christian families, and the children weren't returned, or the children perished. Um, children without parents, parents without children. It was it was unfortunately normal. And um, so what was happening after the war was the highest birth rate in the world in these DP camps, you know. Um, people were starting new families. They needed families, they needed to connect. And they also needed revenge against Hitler. So a lot of these children, Hitler had wanted to destroy Jewish people, so they were going to do, um, do one on uh, Hitler and have as many children as they possibly could. So I am a product of that urge, apparently. So here, <laughs> here is the kitchen of the DP camp where I was born. Um, you see a bunch of women standing around. And this is uh, Leipheim. It's near, near Ginsburg, Stuttgart, in that area of Germany. Um, it, it was under American administration. UNRWA was, was administering the camps, and they had um, military, uh, you know, the American military. My father had been in the Soviet army and he came back to um, his family in Poland and everybody was gone. And so he and a bunch of other former Soviet soldiers and partisans formed an ad hoc brigade of 26 people. And they were engaged by the Brecha, this British unit, to bring um, survivors from the camps over into the West. So he did what a lot of people in Europe seem to be doing now. They snuck over borders and went on trains and off trains and walked a bit and came to Germany. And when they walked into Munich, they still had their Soviet ar army uniforms on because they didn't have any other clothes. And so he walks into US headquarters in Munich and they all look at this bunch of you know armed Soviet soldiers and um, luckily, one of the soldiers that was there, one of the American soldiers, knew Yiddish and heard them talking to each other and said, you know, why are you dressed like that? He told me, he said, well, what are we supposed to do, walk around naked? So the uh, American army was really smart. What they did was they took these soldiers and turned them into DP camp police. 
to protect the uh, survivors, because there were still attacks against survivors in Germany after the war. So um, the, the dining hall at this Leipheim camp was an issue because the, um, the Americans had hired German women to do the cooking for the survivors, and the survivors were not happy. They didn't like the cuisine. They didn't like having the German woman earning money when the um, Jewish women could be earning that money cooking. So first they tried uh, to do it diplomatically and it didn't work, so they staged a strike and made a big to-do and lo and behold, the Jewish women started doing the cooking. So that's the kitchen and at Leipheim. And also there was a little newspaper that came out of Leipheim called Aheim, which I found in, in the uh, in the Library of Congress and at the Holocaust Museum Library. And you see here a bunch of survivors reading that newspaper. And that picture is very much an assertion uh, of, of Jewish survival and Jewish resilience, having babies and producing literature, both very important. So here is, is um, survivor culture in Germany. Um, and uh, some of the survivors made it to the United States. We, we didn't, we, we couldn't get into the United States, so we went to Canada. Um, but um, that was good enough, more than good enough, okay. So, and this is what the barrack looked like at Leipheim. And these are the categories, uh, the first bunch of categories for the songs that I, that seem to make sense to me. So songs about heroism and partisans, um, and also a lot of songs about being in the Katset, in the concentration camps and the ghettos and what that was like. Lots of songs, there were a lot of songs, a lot of songs predate the war, but they touch on emotions that were prevalent. And, and one of those themes is, is a theme of loss. So songs about old age, even though these were not old people, but um, it, philosophizing about the passage of time and about loss uh, was an is an important theme. Home and homelessness. So home, home is interesting because home, what does home mean when you're temporarily in a hotel, having just been temporarily in a DP camp, having just been in some kind of concentration camp or out in the woods? So a lot of the songs are about the old home back before the war but also sometimes about these temporary homes, the day-to-day -day life of where you are, and often also about an imagined future home. So there are quite a few Zionist songs, quite a few of the, the survivors had rejected Europe in total. You see that a lot in the, in the press and the DP camps. They kept referring to the bloody, bloody European soil and to them, there was, this was evidence that Europe had rejected them altogether, and there was no future for Jews in Europe, and that they needed to go to Israel and found a country. And then the, you had all the different political stripes, the Pauli Zion Link and the Pauli Zion Recht, and you know, the, there were so many newspapers with different logos and slogans, and they were battling it out. This was a formative time for Jewish culture because people hadn't quite settled down into places yet. And so they were still trying to imagine who they would be and how they would live and where would their loyalties be and what kind of society would they form. So, um, so all these this, this discussions are quite important. And then there were a lot of funny songs. Those, those are often my favorites. This, one of my favorites is called the, the Lambeth Walk which is a Yiddish, it was a British vaudeville song. It was quite popular in the 20s, uh, ragtime, me and my gal. Um, but there's a Yiddish version of that, and um, I'm not gonna sing it now. But uh, Brett recently sent me a Polish version of that too, so it's, it's quite lively. And um, there's a bunch of smutty songs, really dirty songs um, that, Maybe later at night I can tell you. And <laughs> um, often involving rebbitsons, you know. And uh, then a lot of love songs. These are young people courting. They're hanging out in the hotel lobby and they're hoping to. Uh, in fact, when we did the launch of the website in May in New York, in the very hotel where Stonehill did the collecting, um, there was this fortuitous um, Itzik Gottesman, some of you may know who he was. He remembered that somebody named Masha Leon, who writes for the Forward, 
had written about being in the Hotel Marseille, and I found her tracks. She was then Masha Bernstein, and I sent her her own tracks, which she had forgotten. And she came to the opening and sang her own songs uh, at this opening of the website. It was so moving, and now she, she, she writes to me every so often. She's really amazing. She was a teenager at the time. She had been in the Medem Sanatorium in an orphanage in Poland and then in an orphanage in Lithuania and then managed to somehow be on some kind of transport to Montreal um, and through the war. And then at the end of the war, she told me they wanted to send her back to Poland and she did not want to go back to Poland. So she wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt to let her stay and she did. So she's been in New York ever since, I think, happily. Um, so this quite, these stories are incredible. She's the only person I've found so far that actually sang uh, of all the different people. And I've tried to uh, you know, put things in Yiddish newspapers and various genealogical websites to see if I can turn up any more of these singers. But this was 1948, so it's a while ago now. Lots of songs about orphans, mothers and children. Um, Dos Elen de Kind uh, is very popular. It's, several people sang that. It's about a, fa a parent who puts a child with a, a Christian family and tells the child not to, uh, not to use Yiddish anymore because it'll betray his identity, but also not to forget who he is. So that was very, very powerful song. Um, religious songs, I played you Echot uh, Miodea in Yiddish. There are quite a few singers who seem to have a good uh, cantorial style. Um, there's some nigunim. Uh, so there's some religious material in there that, that's quite wonderful, actually. Uh, there's too much to go into at this point. Um, a lot of political songs. Critical of UNRWA sometimes. UNRWA didn't always do their job so well. Relief agencies. There was a, a thriving black market going on in post-war Europe. Things were not as orderly as they should have been. So some of the songs deal with that. Um, so a lot of songs about what it means to be a Jew. You know, what does it mean to be a Jew in the world? Uh, so were some of the songs were created before the war, but they became even more powerful after the war. So those are some of the categories. I've, I keep developing more. So that's, that's it for the, um, for the PowerPoint. Let me play a couple of the songs that I have, not in PowerPoint, but I was, let's see if I can find it myself here. Uh-oh. All right, never mind, not important. But we'll get to it later. So anyway, so you've heard a bunch of the songs, and I've told you pretty much what there is about the singers and the, the collection and why, why it's important to me to, to develop this collection. Um, one of the things I had hoped would happen is happening. I was at Cornell a couple of weeks ago, and what was it? it was kind of fun. There was a student there who undertook to write the scores for some of the music, and there were about 20 musicians that showed up and played eight of the songs and put them on YouTube. So if you go on YouTube, and I think it's M-I at C-U, you'll hear eight of the songs. And they did an amazing job. They played. They didn't have a whole lot of time to rehearse, so um, it's not the product of extensive you know, performing, but they did a great job. <laughs> And so I was hoping that some of these songs would come alive again, and they have, and they are. So that's really nice to see. Um, some of the songs are really quite rare. Uh, some of the songs are well known. Everybody's heard Bells, and Zognish Kemal, and Vuahin Zolichke. Not everybody, but those are part of a kind of standard, you know, Yom HaShoah repertoire. But there's a whole lot of other things that you don't hear very often, and that, are, that have important messages. So I think the, the content of the songs, what the, the songs are, are, are communication to us over time, and I think it's, it's about time to listen to them. So I think I'll close with that and take questions. Um, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Shabao. <Yeah. laughs> Oh, 
I've been looking for a Heim, and uh -huh. uh, oh yes, and I I am not wasn't able to read the Eva print. I went down to the library, <sighs> and I noticed here that it was in in Yiddish, meaning in Hebrew letters. Yes, and I was and I saw it in you know in, in Roman letters. Very good. Thank you for mentioning that. So what happened was. All but one of the printing presses that could produce Hebrew print were destroyed during the war for whatever purposes. So uh, uh, what, what a lot of these early publications, uh, what they would do calligraphy. They would uh, produce, you know, just by hand on hexagraph machines, write in or create Hebrew fonts. But most of the survivors, many of the survivors, could no longer read Hebrew alphabet because they had been kids or teenagers and didn't have a chance to have a Jewish education. So they, they wanted to get to as many people as they could and maximize communication. So they used the, um, the kind of Polish, Eastern European system of transcription because uh, one of the difficult. major purposes of these publications was to find lost relatives. You know, if you look through these publications, you'll see so-and-so looking for so-and-so, last seen so-and-so. So you want it, you want that information to get through to as many people as possible. So they wrote in the masthead, but everything else is in Latin letters. Mm -hmm. And they had really fun, they had a, a humor column Yes. I actually found a picture of my father as I was going through the, the, uh, the newspaper on the microfilm. Um, he, some, they were trying to fa uh, form some kind of a hospital for the survivors, and they were also interested in getting people healthy again, so there was sports things formed. Women were taught how to make themselves attractive, put nail polish on, so there's all kinds of stuff. And a lot of the survivors had not been... Um, you know, they were not giving out newspapers in, in Auschwitz, you know, so they were really out of touch with the world. And so there was sort of reprints from Stars and Stripes of, you know, what's going on in the world, because they wanted to know what's happening with Israel, with Cyprus, with Soviet Union, so there was sort of that kind of news as well, yeah. So my question is, oh. <laughs> I need some columns from that, somebody told me to look up certain writings. Yes. And I'm not, I couldn't find it on the evil. I couldn't, there was no index. I just couldn't. How can I get that? The, I think the Holocaust Museum, if you're ever in Washington, you know, the Holocaust Museum has a lot of this material on microfilm. Um, it's different than evil? Some of it is the same. I've had an easier time at the Holocaust Museum than at Evo. Um, but that's, you know, I started working with this material back in the mid-1990s. And the hard copies are easier to read. And uh, Brett Werb at the museum just told me they're getting some of the hard copies back uh, available for people to look at. So some of the things are readable on the microfilm. Often they're not. Um, but I did go through pretty much all of Aheim and print it out quite a lot. So maybe I can even help you. Um, I'd like, yeah, okay. Hi, uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about the people who were recorded. How many people were recorded, over what period of time, and were they representative of all the survivors or of survivors from a certain part of Europe, and how did these people get to that hotel? <laughs> well, most of the answer to most of your questions is I don't know, and nobody knows, you know. Um, it maybe he did it over the summer, maybe he did it over a longer period of time, and it's not scientific, you know. These are people who came off the ship, and Hayes was putting people up in various hotels in New York, and so there's nothing scientific about it, um, but there is a certain pattern, you know, so you had, you know, the initial survivors were coming out of the forced marches and the camps, but then you had a sort of follow-up cohort uh, l shortly thereafter of people like my father who had survived in the far eastern parts of the Soviet Union um, and joined. Now, you had the Cold War going around then as well, you know, the beginnings of all that nonsense. So I shouldn't say nonsense, but it was happening. So people like my father had to keep their mouths shut about where they had been during the Second World War. You know, So a lot of this factual material that's out there is sort of factual, 
Um, <laughs> so when people start talking about facts, and I, st you know, I say, well, you know, <laughs> look at it a little strangely. I'm reading a book now by uh, 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 ex uh, Boris Feldman. It's a replacement life. And he's talking about his grandfather, and, and it's very much about this kind of thing. He's writing a kind of fictionalized history of his grandfather to, to get money uh, for restitution. But, and it's very, it's very complicated. It's very convoluted. Um, did I answer all your questions? Um, yeah, OK, good. <laughs> yeah. um, you mentioned that uh, students um, in Cornell were notating the songs. Yeah. Was there any? a uh, serious project um, notating all the songs and comp compiling them and making them accessible? Uh, in you know, this material sat there from, f from 64 when the Library of Congress took it and from 48 when he collected it until I s a few people started working with it before me and I've been in touch with them, but it's very time consuming work. You know, I sit there with ear earphones on, and I cut, and I paste, and I sort, and I listen, and I write. So I, and I'm not a musician, so I can understand the words. Um, but the musical part belongs to somebody else. Now, Brett knows the music better, and Joseph Toltz from Australia knows the musical part better. So they're, uh, they're starting to work with me on that end of things, but I don't even it's dare go there, because I don't know a, a, a treble clef from a bass clef from Gornisch, yeah. Are there recordings available for whoever? You mean of the songs? Of the songs. Yes. On, online, just go into the uh, Center for Traditional Music and Dance website. Uh, it was my goal to get the music out there for people, you know, and um, so there's no CD or anything like that, but you can get it, on, like everything else now, online. Just go cmtd.org and then Stonehill, and you, you can hear them. Not uh, only 67 songs so far, but there'll be more. Um, um, Miriam, in this uh, <coughs> very interesting uh, presentation, you mentioned twice uh, <laughs> Songs about, uh, and this is, you know, the lighter aspect of things, uh, songs about <coughs> a rabbi's wife. Uh, yes. I do know at least one commercially recorded song of the 20s. Oh, it's the oh, it's the Rebetzin. Rebetzin. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. That's in there. Yeah, yeah. But some are, some ah. are worse than that. Uh, it was, was this, was, is this song of the the 20s does it reflect a kind of topos a kind of theme uh that was going around or did it generate uh such so probably probably it was just a common theme i even, think it was a common 20s, theme yeah. i think you know these songs travel and there were all kinds of performers levick hey levick came to the camps with emma shiver after the war and wrote a whole book about Zwischen die Scheres Aplatium and they were giving performing cons. Gigan and Schumacher made this movie Unsere Kinder uh -huh. of a similar mm -hmm. sort of thing in Poland. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one and they have one of the songs that Kaczaginski records, Moes, Moes, Moes is a good Zach, about ration cards. So a lot of the songs are pre-war songs. Some of the pre-war songs are adapted. So there's a version of Tumba Laika. But it's not, it's not the tumbala laika you and I know. It's a different, that he composed, he used the form and the melody, but made it appropriate to Romania in 1944, you know, so, yeah. How did you decide which songs to put on the website first? The ones I liked. <laughs> 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 and some are just really, really hard to hear. Some of the songs go so fast, and the words are often garbled. So that was one of the considerations. Also, I wanted to put on the website a kind of representative sample to have some of each, you know, so that people would know there are love songs and camp songs and political songs. So, so it was a combination of the two. So did you listen to all of them and then make notes or start from the beginning and just say yes on this one? And 
No on that Some one. of the singers are so awful, I can't listen to them. But, <laughs> <laughs> but mostly I do, and mostly I don't, you know, it doesn't matter if they're good singers or not, but what, uh, it's just a matter of time. You know, so I sit there and I splice and I paste and I, you know, and so I haven't listened to all of them at all. Um, and I don't, I can't tell you how many I haven't listened to yet. Um, okay. <laughs> So you're saying that various and sundry people made up songs, that this was a spontaneous thing and yeah. the, and they some of those songs caught on. Yes. Is that the way it Yes, happened? and they traveled. You know, they uh -huh. traveled, you know, people would sing them for each other. They didn't have TVs, they didn't have radios, they didn't have MP3s, they didn't have, you know, they had song, um, you know, yeah. But I would imagine that some people wrote more songs and that their songs were more popular. Absolutely, than they yeah. So Kaczynski yeah. is one of them, and his songs became Stiller, uh -huh. Stiller, uh, um, you know, uh, about a woman who's silencing her child, so Stiller, not to Stiller betray. Stiller, Stiller is, is by Kaczynski. Stiller, uh, Stiller is by I, Alexander no, Tamir. No, right, but he he published them. He uh -huh. he uh -huh. in forty in Munich. They were publishing these books, and, and by 48, he already had two books out with these songs and the music. Uh -huh. But before that, they were available, you know, less formally. Uh. So, yeah, Free Link, um, yeah. So, so those I, and yeah. my grandmother's sing, walking around the house singing was part of a culture. It wasn't absolutely part <laughs> of the culture. Viahin <laughs> Zolchgein was one of the most <laughs> important songs because it asked, "Where shall I go? Who can answer me?" Viahin Zolchgein says, "Verschlossen jede Tür." Every door is closed to us. Says die Welt breit genug noch für uns ist eng und klein. The world is wide enough, but for us it's narrow and small. Because they knew nobody wanted them before the war, during the war, after the war. So, I mean, I know that song, but that yeah. what didn't apply to my grandmother, but she must have sung it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. It's part uh -huh. of a culture. Uh -huh. you know. it's Very interesting. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, really. My pleasure. Are there any more questions? Uh, so, Center for Traditional Music and Dance is the uh, ctmd.org. Yeah, yeah. I remember it by Connecticut, Maryland, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Peter Shevsky is the person in charge of, and he's a busy man. He's right now organizing a big Yiddish festival in December for continuing class camp in New York City. So he doesn't have a whole lot of spare time to upload songs. I've delivered to him a couple of sets of MP3s by Kaczynski and another by Blumenfeld, and hopefully in the next couple of months those should be available. And so um, if people want to help me and, and it becomes a, um, what's the word that they use, um, crowdsourcing thing, yes, uh, that would be great. Um, uh, but uh, right now I just do as much as I, I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it's um, if you go in YouTube, it's M I with my initials at C U, and my whole lecture is going to be uh, put up. Yes, and also I gave a lecture at the Library of Congress in 2013. That's also available on YouTube. Um, yeah. Oh, it's an amazing story. So he was he was living in Rochester. He grew up in Rochester, and immigrant family. And when he became a young man, some of his friends were going off to Cornell University. Connect, correct me if I've got the family story wrong, but some of his friends went off to Cornell. Uh, but he couldn't afford to go to the university, so he learned a trade. He became a flooring installer and moved to New York and got married and had a couple of sons and continued working as a flooring installer and did this on the side. And he, um, he was apparently a very good salesman 
and talked a new company called the Chicago something or another report recording company. They had just developed this technology for reel to reel. So he borrowed uh, some of their equipment, saying that it, he, it was a demo model. And he used the demo model to record all this. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, it's just, I can't even, you know, emotionally, you know, to do all this work, to gather all this up. And it was part of a larger, larger phenomenon. You know, Jews for a long time have been aware that Yiddish culture is endangered. Ansky uh, did this whole recording, in, you know, uh, much earlier on wire reels. Um, th there were other people out there trying to gather in, because several things were happening. You had all these wars, and you had urbanization. So you had people leaving their villages, leaving their traditional lives. So you wanted to get that down, because Jewish culture has a very strong preservation instinct, right? So you want to get it down as quickly and as much as you can. So he was part of that. Um, and he, I, that 64 lecture that he gave at Evo, you know, really shows that, how, you know, that this was something he was very proud of. And, yeah, and just did. Yeah, yeah. He, there's a list, there's a list of the first lines of all of the songs, um, handwritten and then somebody else typed it, and that, that's it. And then what I first started doing was to create a master list using his, list, so whenever I'd listen to things, I'd fill in the name of the singer and stuff they said. So I have a master list, and then I, and then I decided that wasn't good enough. I needed to also sort out the MP3s, so, so yeah. yeah. So I have a question about dance. So it's the center, traditional center for music and dance, and I'm wondering if you could just say something about, or is there, is there much dance that was, re that was documented in some way from this era? Dance? Yes. Not that I, I don't know is, is the, is the so, answer. Uh, Except for the Lambeth Walk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so did, is the center something that you started? No, 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 no. no. Uh, Marty Koenig and Ethel Rehm oh, started Marty this. Oh, Marty Koenig? Marty Koenig and oh. Ethel Rehm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I just saw him recently at the Macedonian Embassy. You look like Ethel Rain, actually. I do. <laughs> Everyone's told me that. She doesn't think so, but I, I, uh, <laughs> I'm proud to look like her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At the Hotel Marseille? Are you one of those babies crying in the background? No, you, were, you weren't there yet. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. There you hear babies in the background, you hear cars honking. I mean, it's very much a living thing, you know. Yeah. I have an answer to the dance question that you had. Okay. Uh, there is very, very little of dance that's available. Uh, the best that people seem to have been able to do is to go to, to the movies from the late 30s and occasionally to weddings in the, in the States and then subsequent to this period and watch how people danced. And in 1985, and the best they can do. In 1985, Bronya Sokolovna uh, taught a quadrille somewhere in New York. And she, she was from somewhere in the former Soviet Union. And Center for Traditional Music and Dance, I think, has that. And I'm in it. I was actually dancing. In, with Zeb Feldman in 85 and, and in that thing, <laughs> yeah. But I think it was, I don't know, never mind, I won't go into it, yeah. All right, <laughs> uh, any more questions? All right, well thank you all for coming out. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's really fun to be here in California. I, I'm enjoying it a lot. <laughs> it's a crazy place, but fun, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>